Hello, good evening to you, Mr. Chair, and to everyone who's sitting here patiently through this very important hearing. Um, first and foremost, I want to thank you for actually expanding the topic that you did about a year and a half ago um, concerning HGFCs. And I think it's really great that you opened it up to all cooperatives. Um, and there's a reason why I think it's great. Um, I think we all need to think about why people own. Like, why would you own versus rent anything? I think you need to start from that standpoint, and then you can sort of rationalize or, or think about what's in it for the people who live in HDFCs, what's in it for the people who live in market rate cooperatives. So it's like the American dream. You want to own something. So anyone says, who says, oh, you know, it's a failed model, it doesn't work, or what have you, there are not that many models for ownership in New York City that are at all affordable. This is probably the last existing model. So at best, it has to be improved upon, but it definitely can't be scrapped. Um, you want use and enjoyment, the warrant of hab habitability, and all of those things. You also want, it doesn't matter if you're low, you know, low income or moderate income, you want, it doesn't matter if you pay $250 for your unit. You want your unit to appreciate in value, and you want, if necessary, or if you want, or if you so choose to sell it sometime, you want to be able to do so. Um, you want to do so for a myriad of reasons. You want to do so because you want to put your child through college, or you want to send your child to you know, the best private school in New York City, or you want to leave and as you mature and go to a warm area and live in a very large house that you could probably get in selling your unit. And that doesn't make you any different than anyone else who owns property in the United States. And it, it doesn't criminalize you. It doesn't make you greedy. That's why you own property, OK? I am the dissenting voice um, when it comes to raising, um, to putting a, a cap on the resale price. I am, again, Tyrita Foster of Foster, Lynch, and Thomas. I have been a practicing attorney on the ground in Harlem on 135th Street for 13 years. I have also, given my background as a corporate attorney, also structured conversions. So I'm very well aware of a lot of the issues at play. But nonetheless, we should not, no one should have to go to the government all the time for money, for oversight, what have you. Why? Regime change under certain you know, uh, regimes, under certain um, dynamics, there was money, there was assistance. Then there's a change, and there isn't money and assistance. These are corporations, whether they're market rate corporations or whether they're um, HDFCs. There are income restrictions that protect affordability. They need to be improved upon, but they're there. 120% of the AMI. That AMI discussion, that's a Washington discussion. So I'm not going to get into that. But that's the discussion on affordability. Other than that, the market does have to be at play. If you fit within the income restriction guidelines as a, willing, as a, as a um, potential purchaser, you should be allowed, the seller should be allowed to get the highest price possible. And why is that? Because the seller is, the seller is you know, a citizen of the United States or uh, a, a natural, an alien of, of, of the US or what have you, but there's a reason why they bought it in the first place. When people talk about these potential um, new sort of restrictive resale policies and capping the resale price, I've seen those policies. I've seen the six-page documents that were put together by other attorneys, by UHAB, and by the board of directors. And they're so limiting. It's not even just there's a cap on the price. There are um, warped right of first refusals. There are time delays in which the board can make a decision whether they even want to buy the unit back. During that time, the market is, do, the mar market is always fluid. So during that time, we could have another economic decline. And so like, let's say on the 60th day, 
you know, the co-op board might decide they're not going to buy your unit. But you've lost your potential purchaser. Your potential purchaser might have lost their job, um, might see the, the, um, the, not see the value in the asset. Things happen, and time matters. As I said, I've been practicing here for 13 years, and it is not perfect. But to say be business as usual, to say, you know, there's, you know, corruption within these boards, again, and I said this in my prior testimony, there's corruption everywhere. There was corruption at HPD. So the whole idea that this organization is going to be the standard bearer and that everyone needs them to, to be the overseeing organization because they need this is inherently troublesome. Um, again, these are corporations. These were non-performing buildings. These were non-performing assets on the city's books. And there are theories out there that you, it wasn't just a benevolent thing to sort of turn them over to the people. You need people inside housing. You know, when you look at the foreclosure crisis of 2008, there were lots of buildings sitting fallow. When a building sits fallow, there's mold, there's infestation, there's all types of stuff. So it wasn't like this benevolent thing, like, oh my God, you're like low income, here's this thing so you can own it. It's $250. No, we need you to sit there. We need you to sit in that building because if we leave it like this, all types of environmental hazards and decay will happen. So we put you there. But at the same time, those buildings, like any other building in the city, whether they're for profit, you know, whether they're market rate or not, they need to be constantly improved upon. Um, the structure was faulty to begin with. And the thing is, the money isn't there. They're reserve accounts and operating accounts like any other corporation, you know? It's like savings accounts, it's like whatever. They don't have them. And they're not going to get it from HPD. HPD is not going to give them millions and millions of dollars. What I heard very clearly from HPD is that they're willing to take away a tax abatement or attempt to so that they would coerce people to coming under their fold. And that, to me, is disgusting. You don't take something away and think that the people are going to want to be under your umbrella. That's, that's disgusting. It's interesting, um, it, the New York State Attorney General's <laughs> office, they're also in this sort of um, H, you know, HDFC, any, in cooperative um, in New York State. It, their offering plan has to be approved by the New York State Attorney General's office. Those offering plans, you know, for anyone you know, who's interested, are usually like 350 pages. They're long, right, and they're dense. And as a lawyer, I'm supposed to like review them, you know, and I do, but 350 pages of dense reading is dense reading. But buried in some of them is an opinion by HPD counsel. And it's hilarious. Well, it's not hilarious, it's just not cool. <laughs> um, people who live in HDFCs don't even get the tax break. They don't get the deduction. Right, so they can't deduct, they're not supposed to, um, their maintenance because there's no correlation between the number of shares that they're allocated and, um, and what would be the fair market value of the, um, the property. What I mean by that is usually people get 250, 250, 250. You could have a, a, an apartment that, a unit that it has two bedrooms, whatever, you're really getting 250 in a lot of the HDFCs, right? So you can't, as an owner, even deduct your maintenance for your taxes. Because, I mean, again, we are, the people who invest in these are looking at all of these advantages, and they should. That's why you own as opposed to rent. But they don't even get the benefit. So they don't get the tax benefit, and you want some, like, ridiculous cap. No, like, absolutely not. I don't want my people to remain low income. I don't want to be sitting in this room 20 years from now and in, in part, have it be that black and Hispanic people are always considered the low income people that um, just one can't get it together, and two, just have to stay in their station. I want us to benefit from the investment. I don't care that, hey, if they were wise, $250, you paid your $250, and if you can cash out in the end, so be it. Because yep. you should be able, sorry, you should be able to sing your child to the best of schools and do all those quintessential American things that people do when they make 
an investment. Ms. Foster, now, Ms. Yes. Foster, uh, um, we have to wrap up, but I just have a couple questions for you. A couple questions. I will wrap up. Can I just okay, this? Okay, great. So, um, with that being said, um, I, as a practicing or, uh, attorney, oftentimes see, you know, certain things that do need repair. Um, Co-op boards anywhere, whether they're HGFCs or whether they're market rate, um, there are issues. Um, there are issues and time delays. There are issues in terms of review of um, application packages for purchasers. I received a call from a young woman, um, an unexpected call from a client's daughter. Her mom had actually passed away. Her mom had stage four breast cancer and was my client for two years. I knew she had stage four breast cancer. She was a shareholder. I told the building, the co-op uh, attorney that she had stage four breast cancer, that they needed to sort of act quickly um, and expeditiously in processing her want to sell her unit. They sat on it. They sat on, sat on, sat on it for two years, and now this woman is deceased. Um, co-ops don't have to explain why they deny people, okay? And people think that that's a good thing because you can just deny and what have you. In the 50s, 60s, 70s, and prior, what have you, I mean, those types of denials often went toward black and Hispanic people. Other people would say, no, you can't live here. Um, famous entertainers had to have people stand in for them to purchase. And as much as the change of these communities matters to people and they're concerned about it, it can be a life or death matter. You can't say no, no, no to people who are otherwise income qualified um, and have that be a good result. You can't, you, you can't legislate or allow for discrimination. You just can't do it. And to a certain extent, that's what's happening now. And it doesn't matter like what color you are on either side. Like Discrimination should not be tolerable. Um, you know, my, my notes say a lot of what they need to say, so that's okay. Um, but there's one other thing that's not on my notes that I will say before um, Mr. Chairman, you know, has his questions. Um, in Harlem in particular, there are lots of churches in Harlem. And one of the things that churches do is they fill a gap of a lot of things, a gap of the government, a gap um, from private industry. In terms of churches are, people, are places where people, of course, of faith go, but you go for services. You go for help. You go for job assistance. You go for lots of things. Lots of churches in Harlem are, being, are not economically doing well. And there's a practice going on with, within this community where people are going to the churches, and they're like, hey, let me build a co-op. Let me, you know, you are low-lying. Let me build a co-op, right? I saw there was a long-term pastor who just passed away, and I looked up on Acris. I looked up how, because his, his church had been sold. Um, his church sold for $1.54 million. His church is the size of half a city block. Now, that sale had to be approved by the New York State Attorney General's office. Um, $1.54 million is nothing. Um, your average brownstone in Harlem costs a lot more than that. Okay, so again, as I said, I won't talk about AMIs, but I will say this. When you're looking, when developers are saying that they cannot build affordable housing um, because the, the numbers don't work, you have to be aggressive as legislators, as whomever is interested in peeling away the layers. If your acquisition cost is 1.54 million and the a average acquisition cost of the same sort of um, square footage far in, in New York would be $20 million, but you got it one, for 1.54, don't ever let them say they can't build it affordable because they can, because they're, they, you know, the difference in that acquisition cost is enough that they can build affordable units. Thank, Thank you, you, Ms. Foster. Thank you so much. Uh, you. My, my quick question is, mm -hmm. how high do you expect a sale price to be for purchase to still be possible for a buyer at or below middle income or lower AMI to be able to purchase? It happens all the time. 
unfortunately, a lot of the HDFCs um, don't have re- money in their reserve accounts, right? So they need to sell all cash. That's the issue. It's not that they can't get financing. You can get financing when your books are in the black. We buy and sell all these things, and we represent HDFCs all over the place. And so, I mean, Bank of America, Chase, they give loans. They give loans as long as your books are in order, you, have, you know, certified uh, public accountant records, what have you. Mm. Um, the income qualifications are, and restrictions are what they are. There are things that happen, like people die every day, and they leave their relatives money. It doesn't mean your income has gone up. It means you've got some money that your grandma left you, and your grandma wanted you to do things like buy property and what have you, and this is your windfall to do so, but that's just one moment in time. So you make an investment in an HDFC or any other cooperative. You shouldn't be penalized for that because it happens for a lot of people. It doesn't matter what race you are. These are things that happen, and that's great. Because not only is it that you can do something that the legacy of what your family wanted you to be able to do, but it's also very healthy for the building. The building gets, has a flip tax. And so on the sales, if, if the amount is more, the building has money. So when the building has money, they can make their own repairs. They don't need to be like, hey, HPD, two people, help me, help me, help me. They don't need to because they have their own money. And so to me, it is not a positive thing. And I, I noticed what you were saying, like, don't we need them back in this thing? That's not a positive thing. That wouldn't show growth if these, these buildings that were under the auspices of HPD for, like, 20-something years, if they had to go back under. You don't want it to be that way. You want them to operate effectively and efficiently. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Foster. We now with us, have us with us the Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Thank you very much. I'll skip around testimony because I know others want to participate. But I am Gail Brewer, and I am the Manhattan Borough President. I want to thank the Assembly Member Chair, and I want to thank the wonderful Assembly Member from the Bronx also. Um, it's great to be here. So. I'm, uh, I think over my years of being a West Side Council Member and Borough President, I, I begin to understand the three kinds of challenges regarding subsidized co-ops, HCFCs, Mitchellamas, and co-ops that receive 421A tax exemption. Um, and I would like to call for the following. Number one, preserve the affordability of HCFCs. It must be done in conjunction with adequate financing and reduce property tax burden tied to increased agency oversight. Number two, state and city and all government agencies must make financing available to Mitchell Lamas for capital improvements before development takes steps to exit the program. Of course, we don't want them to exit the program. State and city agencies should work closely with co-ops whose 421A tax exemptions, while they have it, are expiring in order to preserve the affordability. HDFCs are more complicated than I could ever begin to describe, but according to data tracked by HPD, as of April 2015, 3,203 buildings classify as HDFC in New York City. 30% of these, or about 902, became HDFCs through the tenant interim lease, or what we call TIL. We all know what TIL is and what it was, in rent properties that were left (coughs) to the government. In October 2015, you have Urban Homesteading Assistance Board undertook a count of HDFCs within their portfolio, which may not be everything, but in Manhattan there are 709 HDFC co-op buildings totally approximately 19,000 <coughs> units, and most of them are in Central and West Harlem. 378 buildings totaling 10,182 units just in Council Districts 7 and 9 alone here in Manhattan. We know that HDSDs offer one of the only opportunities for low-income New Yorkers, as you heard earlier, to become homeowners, as you know. It becomes more difficult for households classified as low-income, 50% AMI or locally, or local, or lower, or even lower, to purchase a unit now or if they are already shareholders, which is what I find, to continue paying the, um, the maintenance. We know about the property tax challenges, the water bills challenges, the building repair challenges. All these expenses have to be met, and I get a lot of calls, and you get a lot of calls, and I think this is going to continue. 
the city's Division of Alternative Management Program, which you know well, tax exemption caps the property tax burden of an HDFC unit. Currently, it is $9,223 per unit. However, unless the tax cap is extended beyond 2029, shareholders living in hot real estate markets, which is what Manhattan seems to have become, unfortunately, will see a steep increase in their property taxes when the tax cap ends. HCFCs receiving the damp tax cap have had difficulty in obtaining financing to repair their buildings. There are only 13 years left, and it goes like this, until 2029. Lenders are hesitant to underwrite rehab loans that amortize for longer than the remaining years of damp. So for buildings with capital needs, and there are many of them that are substantial, qualifying for a loan that amortizes in less than 13 years requires interest rates that are not affordable. Guess what? This leaves HCFCs in disrepair. There are some false solutions, and I think you know what they are. Some HCFCs, I've seen this too much, I have to say, sell vacant units at market rate. I've seen $730,000 to generate cash to cover expenses. There's one example a little bit less on East 124th Street. It had almost $12,000 in unpaid property taxes and $70,000 or $71,000 in unpaid water bills. The board of that HDFC sold two units at market rate to pay off the debt. And this case, in this example, was like $130,000. So they were able to comply with Article 11 in practice by approving the buyers under the bylaws stated income limit, what it said on the 1099. However, when you look at ACRIS, which is the city's database, it shows that the very same board treasurer who signed off on these two transactions purchased his unit in 2012 for $85,000, which is a difference of 40 to 50% in pricing over only three years' time. Other HCFCs have privatized or sought to by selling whole buildings to private buyers. Once privatized, buildings cease to be HCFCs, and in response to a high number of privatization that it noticed among former HCFCs on the Lower East Side, the Attorney General's office issued a guidance memo to re-emphasize the restrictions that keep an Article 11 entity from shedding its low-income housing obligation. Again, these are things that you may know, but it's good to list them all. Mm -hmm. How are we going to deal with this? What are solutions? HCFCs can cut costs by making large-scale purchases collaboratively. There are some in East Harlem that have done just that, buying bulk in terms of heating oil. Um, management companies can be the same, uh, eliminating duplicate services. Uh, the governor and the state work toward the goal of 50% renewal electricity by 2030. These are all things that might help, again, information and education to the HDFCs. Another is to build up a strong reserve. Um, the vast majority of these buildings created under the business corporation law went through till. Unfortunately, many TILBs waited for decades before becoming HDFCs, and during the delay, they spent down their reserves. HPD did not allow TILBs to rent out vacant apartments to generate income, even if the units weren't used for relocation purposes. And I know that uh, Assemblymember Wright and me and others recently met with tenants from 615 West 150th Street, a building by HPD's admission is doing everything right, yeah. But now it's got a depleting reserve due to delays, and I think the assembly member knows all about that. So uh, there is a task force on city-owned properties, uh, which uh, the assembly and the attorney general's office and our office, we've been working with HBD to address all of these issues. I mean, one suggestion is to try to come up with some ideas um, about stronger enforcement and oversight agency through a voluntary adoption of a new regulatory agreement. It was my experience on the West Side that is not so easy to do given some of the challenges of the boards. Receiving full property tax exemption would allow HCFCs to focus their resources on paying down their debt and building up reserves. And that incentive linked to a regulatory agreement might strengthen HPD's ability to enforce affordability regulations. These buildings need new, two kinds of financing. They need financing, financing for aging buildings, for capital improvements, and they need financing for home buyers to purchase HDFC 
uh, units. Not many banks do that, but certainly something like the Lower East Side People's Federal Credit Union does, but there aren't a lot that make that effort. I mean, other things that might be able to do is work with local businesses, established businesses um, that are looking to purchase a commercial co-op unit if there are commercial possibilities in that building. And I know for a fact that has its other challenges, but it's another way to try to deal with this issue. There are internal HDFC issues, and they are sometimes the biggest challenge. On December 8, 2015, I know that Assemblymember Wright came by with the New York State Attorney General's office. Uh, we had a special briefing for all shareholders. We had hundreds of people, standing room only, show up in this building. And the AG's office explained the restrictions that limit privatization. We talked about space for shareholders to... Uh, deal with their questions and concerns as board members. We went through what's a board, how a board is accountable, what to do about illegal sublets, what to do about pri prioritizing unit sales, and many other issues. There are so many governance challenges that shareholders face, and they need to be addressed, and they haven't been adequately. So uh, I think the governance issue, I won't go through all the details listed here, but the governance issues are big ones in HDFCs, and they need a lot more support in addressing them. Mitchell Lamas. Um, I think that uh, I had many Mitchell Lamas when I was a member of the city council in my district, co-ops and rental. In terms of the co-ops, and I know you have members of the uh, audience here who know much more about this than, than I do, but unfortunately, in my opinion, the exits were in compliance, of course, with the PHFL Article 2 provisions, which permit Mitchell Lama developments to prioritize after 20 years by prepaying the mortgage. Um, I don't think any of us 20 years ago realized how fast 20 years goes by. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that we would end up in a hot market where everybody would want to buy their apartment. Um, the State uh, Homes and Community Renewal, HCR, needs to address Mitchell Lama preservation through changes in financing. We have in Manhattan the remaining 32 Mitchell-Lama co-ops were built between 1950 and 1977, and many of them need substantial capital improvement. Many of them are asking me for that in the capital request in FY17. And there is some money available through uh, HDC and maybe HFA. You probably know more about it than I do, um, but they need to be worked on and supported to get this kind of funding. Absolutely necessary in order to keep this uh, Mitchell Lama that's left affordable and to keep them in the program. Finally, 421A subsidized co-ops. The 421A tax subsidy program expired, as you know better than I, on January 15th of this year. And while no new 421A project is in the pipeline, as I understand it, 16 co-ops in Manhattan will continue receiving 421A subsidy until their tax exemptions expire. These co-ops maintenance will increase drastically when taxes, the property taxes, are fully phased in. For some co-ops, the timing may coincide with full amortization of construction loans on their buildings, often in the form of a final balloon payment. The spike in both operating and debt service expenses may result in complete turnover of shareholders who can no longer afford their maintenance, opening the door, as you know, only too well for high-income buyers. In anticipation of all of this, government agencies such as HFA and HDC should engage with the residents now of these co-ops to explore refinancing and other property tax exemptions. If a new regulatory agreement is adopted during the period before the exemption expires, 421A, it may preserve co-op units as affordable. At the least, additional financing will preserve housing stability by enabling shareholders at the time of 421A expiration to remain in their buildings. In summary, I urge the committee to work with, as you will, state and local agencies to make financing available to preserve the affordability of co-op housing in general. HDFCs, we need to lower the shareholders' cost burden by offering full tax exemption with the condition of agency oversight with this regulatory agreement that I talked about. Number two, we talked about the, bul the bulk purchases, make fi financing available for buyers of HDFC, we talked about that. Enable oversight agencies and technical assistance provider 
to improve a building's government issues, easier said than done. And for Mitchell Lamas, uh, HCR and HFA should make capital improvement financing available. And for 421A, as I said, the government financing agency should anticipate the financing needs of the buildings coming out of subsidy and make sure they have financing. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. And I think you have copies, so you can. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Borough President, for this comprehensive report. I think it was um, Thank something you very that we much. all wanted to hear and certainly what we all wanted needed to hear. Mr. Pichardo. Mr. Chair, thank you. Madam President, thank you again. It's always a pleasure to see you as well. Uh, very quickly, uh, I just have a really quick question. In terms of the 421A subsidized co-ops, do you have a, a, uh, a price number in terms of average or ballpark that this would cost once these uh, exemptions expire for these co-ops? I don't. I'll be honest with you. I have uh, medium expertise in HCFCs from personal experience and a whole lot of expertise on Mitchell Lamas, yeah. but I don't, I could get back to. I just, I know the other two better. I'll okay. be very honest with well, you. Well, if you have those numbers. Yeah, we'll get them to you. All right. Thank All you, right. Madam President. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you very much. <laughs> Next, we have Barbara Askins, um, head of the uh, 125th Street bid. Mm -hmm. Good, good, good. 